Hello, everyone, and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. We'll get Genevieve to stop sharing her screen. That's great, thank you. I am coming to you today from my home, which is located on the territories of the Lekwungen people in Victoria, British Columbia. RBCM at Home started in March when our museum and archive closed due to the pandemic. It was an opportunity to talk to staff about what they were working on from home. Now, even though the museum has reopened, we've continued this program as a way of staying connected with people at home or school around the province. This program and previous ones have been recorded and you can find them on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. Just a note, uh, today's program will be longer than our typical program. It's going to go at least 45 minutes, if not a little bit longer, depending on your question. So again, if you do have to leave, it is being recorded and you will be able to catch it later on the YouTube channel. Today, my guest is archivist Genevieve Weber from our own BC Archives. Genevieve is an outreach archivist and community liaison and has been with the BC Archives since 2016. In addition to assisting with research requests, providing access to records and facilitating workshops, she also provides community tours, special interest workshops and works with indigenous communities all over the province. Hello, Genevieve. Hello, thank you. In pre-pandemic times, you would give orientations like this in person. Um, for what kinds of groups would you do that for? And really what was the main purpose? Well, we would, um, we would have lots of different groups come in. So sometimes we would work with genealogical societies, um, university classes, uh, special interest groups, government employees who use the archives. So many different people come in to use the archives. So we would meet with lots of different groups. Um, and I would run workshops like this where we would be in person. And I would often start with a slideshow similar to the one that I'm going to show today, but then we would move into the reference room and get to work hands on with the records, which unfortunately we can't do right now. Well, um, today, an advantage of being online is we do have participants, it looks like from all over Canada, we have Alberta, Ontario, Saskatchewan, um, we have and England, I saw now yes we have someone also joining us from England and from the United States. Um, some of this information today is going to be very relevant for the BC archives. So if you have family and um, people you want to look up in our BC archives, but the general ideas will also apply to other archives uh, that you may want to search. So without further ado, Genevieve, I'm going to pass it over to you for um, sharing your screen. Great. Thank you so much. Everyone just give me a moment, folks, and I'll get my slide started. Okay. Well, thank you again, Cam. I really appreciate the introduction and I will get started. I wanna start by acknowledging that I am uh, coming to you today from my home, which is on the traditional, to ter the traditional territory of the Lekwungen and Wasanich people here in Saanich, BC uh, near Victoria. And I encourage you all to consider the traditional territory whose land you are on today, wherever you are. Uh, whether that's in North America or elsewhere, is something that I certainly think about a lot when I'm at work uh, in the reference room. We, as Kim said, I work with a lot of Indigenous communities and when Indigenous researchers come in, I'm particularly aware of the land that we're on and we do hold a lot of records that um, that took place on land just across the harbour from where the reference room is. You can look out the window and see the exact spot where photographs of ceremonies uh, took place. So it's really important for me to keep that in mind as I do my work. So today's presentation, feel free to ask questions throughout. And if I don't notice them, I'm sure Kim will let me know. Um, but these are the sorts of things that we'll be talking about. So if you do have questions about coming on site, um, Bear in mind, I will eventually get there. I'll try not to take too long getting there, um, but feel free to ask questions as, as we go through and there'll be some time at the end as well. This introduction is, um, is aimed at new researchers, but you don't have to be a new researcher. If you've come in before, that's great. Uh, it's always good to have a refresher about how uh, to go about getting started on a new research project, what to do from home, what to do on site, 
And particularly now during the pandemic, there's uh, been a lot of changes at the archives as there have been in most places. So I'll be talking about what you need to do that's a little bit different if you do want to come on site. As Kim mentioned, this, this presentation is really specific to the BC archives, but so much of the concepts and the ideas behind how to do research will transfer to other archives. So state archives or provincial archives or other community archives, wherever you are. So the basic ideas of how to do the research and how to find the information that you're looking for, you should be able to take those uh, to wherever it is that you are. And as you'll see, a lot of the research can be done from home. So that's, uh, that's great. You can do it no matter what part of the world you're in. So to begin with, what exactly are the BC Archives? The BC Archives is part of the Royal BC Museum. They've been the same organization since 2003. This is a photograph of the buildings where they're located from the year that they opened in 1970. Uh, the buildings were purpose built as a museum and archives as a cultural precinct in Victoria, British Columbia. You can't quite see this much of the buildings now because there's a lot of trees that have grown in the meantime. So the low building at the front with the diamond motif at the top, that is the archives building. My office is right in one of those windows. It's a great, a great spot to be in. And the BC Archives is the provincial repository for the government of BC. That means that records that were created in government ministries across the province that have been um, appraised for uh, long-term retention in the archives, those come to us. So we get a, a sampling of records from all the different ministries in the government. Sometimes people hear that and they think, well, that doesn't sound very interesting. But if you think about all the things that government is involved in, education, environment, land, indigenous rights, everything that you can think of that the government does, we get records from those areas, those parts of, of our daily life. In addition to government records, we get private records. Private records are any non-government record. Those come to us from individuals, from families, from corporations, companies, and organizations. So if you think about um, the Kreese family was a prominent early settler family here in, in British Columbia. We have the records of that family, for example. Um, we have the records of lots of companies that the industry was really uh, relevant to British Columbia. So for example, the Cedar Shake and Shingle Company is one that I like to include because it's really difficult to say and I'm always proud when I manage to say it correctly. Um, but making cedar shakes and shingles was a really important industry here in BC. So we were able to acquire those records when the company closed down. Um, so those are the types of things. So when you think about where the records might come from, those are some of the, the places that they come from. But what exactly is a record? People often hear archivists talking about records and they might think of um, a vinyl LP that you had in the, in the 70s. Um, but they're not, people aren't always totally sure what a record is. So if anyone has any guesses, feel free to throw it in the chat. But in the meantime, um, I'll, I'll go through a few of the different record types. Archivists define a record as any, anything that records information, any recorded information in any way. And I like to think of the different senses that we have, sight and hearing and all the different ways that we sense the world. There's as many different ways to create and record information. The first type is textual records. So this is what boxes of textual records look like in the stacks in the archives. A textual record is anything that's written down. So if it's written down, um, it can be written on a single piece of paper. It could be typed into a Word document on a computer or typed on a typewriter. It might be written in a journal or in a bound ledger. But if it's something that is written on paper, then we call it a textual record. I saw a few comments coming up. Kim, was there any other guesses of what types of records we have? Darren uh, is saying electronic records, mm. microfilm, microfiche. Yeah, so microfilm and microfiche are a really interesting one because technically those are copies of other types of records. So microfilm and microfiche are a way of viewing textual records or maybe cartographic records, which I think is the next record type to come up on my picture here. Uh, a cartographic record is uh, architectural drawings, maps, and plans. 
So anytime that somebody is um, creating a map or working on creating something, again, usually two-dimensional on a blueprint, uh, something like that, we call those cartographic records. And we also, um, you might find those on microfilm or microfiche. So records like maps are often put on microfiche and microfilm and microfiche are used um, as a way to provide greater access to records and for preservation reasons. So in the reference room, if you've been to our reference room or another one, you might have accessed records that way. Before digitization, this is how records were uh, made more accessible to the public so that people wouldn't have to be handling the original records so much, and um, especially if they're fragile and, and uh, at risk of being damaged. But it also is a way to make records more accessible because more people can look at them at the same time and at times when there isn't an archivist on site to help with the originals. Sound recordings are another type of record that we have. So uh, sound recordings can be on various formats like cassette or reel-to-reel -reel recordings, tape reels, and uh, or CD, of course. <laughs> um, and sound recordings might be of a radio show, a radio program. They might be of music, or they could be of oral history. So many archives, including this one, have had extensive oral history programs in the past. Um, and those are, I think somebody had mentioned in the chat earlier that they found an oral history recording of their relative in the archives once. And a lot of people don't even realize that their relatives have been recorded because they think, well, my relative wasn't a politician or somebody famous, but maybe they worked in an industry that was really important to that region or had another experience that the archives uh, wanted to make sure was captured. So they, there might be recordings of that. Moving picture records, that's an old fashioned sounding way of saying any type of record where you watch it on a screen of some kind. So again, reel to reel film, VHS, beta, um, DVD, all kinds of different ways of capturing moving picture images. And we have plenty of those as well. And again, they could be newscasts or interviews for other reasons. Um, they might be in our archives, we have a lot of uh, government informational films, which are fascinating, really interesting uh, collections of records. And photographs, we have lots of photographs. So we have around 200,000 that have been digitized and are available through our website. So when you go to our database, you'll see lots of pictures that have thumbnail images attached. But we have, we guess, over 5 million photographs altogether. So the 200,000 is, is a drop in the bucket in terms of the, great, the greater collection. Um, but there's lots of photographs and lots of really interesting images of the province. A question, Genevieve, yep. about that audiovisual um, pieces. What Art is wondering, what equipment um, do you use to digitize these kinds of things? There's, you mentioned real real tape, there's cassettes, there's home videos, I imagine. Yeah, there's, that's a great question. We have, I don't have a photo of it, unfortunately, today, but we have this bay of wonderful, <laughs> very ancient, old-fashioned now looking um, machines that our digital technician who, who does some of this work will use to digitize. So he's got a, a bunch of different things because there's so many different types of hardware that have been used over time. But whenever there is something that we don't have the machine for, or if it's a very large collection of records, then we'll send it off site to a place that specializes in doing uh, large scale digitization projects. Um, so quite often that's what happens. But if we have one or two things and we happen to have the right piece of equipment, then we can do it on site. Um, and the technician's really good about, about transferring that. He knows a lot about um, cleaning up the sound as well. So we'll capture an exact recording that we call the preservation copy, which has all the kind of crackles and scratches uh, maintained. And then he'll make a cleaned up version that um, can be easier, a little bit easier to listen to sometimes. Uh, in addition to the primary source material that we have in the archives, we also have uh, some secondary source material and other types of records. So on the right, we have a painting that is from our painting drawings and prints or PDP collection. Uh, this collection over time, it's had um, the way it's been collected has changed at various points. Uh, it, sec parts of it are, are what we would call a documentary art collection. 
Uh, so art that was collected uh, to fill in gaps in other areas of the collection. Um, but we have an art curator, so she collects art that is uh, representative and significant to BC in many ways. Um, in addition to the art collection, we have a library collection. Our library collection is non-circulating, so we can't share it outside of the building but it complements the records that you would be looking at on site. And people often forget about our library collection. So I always encourage people to look through the library database if they're going to be coming on site so that they can order the books that they want to look at as well. Uh, the library collection includes government publications, museum publications, rare books. We have a sheet music collection, pamphlets, all kinds of interesting stuff. What about newspapers? Are those in the library collection? Yes, so great question. Uh, and the newspaper is something else that we often look at on microfilm. The newspaper collection, uh, we do not have the major newspapers after about 1920. And the reason for that is that those are quite widely accessible in other areas and other spaces. And they take up a lot of space. Um, so for example, the British Colonist, which is one of the main newspapers, has been almost entirely digitized and is really easily searchable online. So I recommend you go to their website. It's, it, it can be a bit of a rabbit hole once you start searching through there. It's a lot of fun to look through. Um, so that's a great resource. Uh, but we, what we do have that's really useful is smaller local newspapers. So if you're looking for information about a particular small community in BC, uh, there's a good chance that we have a newspaper from that area. It can be a great way to narrow down dates for an event, and then that can help you to look for other original primary source material about that event as well. So, Karen is wondering if there's a finding aid for newspapers. There is an index online. So uh, when I'll have a screenshot that shows where all of our reference guides and indexes are, and you can read about the newspapers there. Um, in the index, uh, the, the newspapers are not, those ones are not digitized, so they're available by using microfilm on site. And when I get to the part about um, coming on site, there'll be information about how you can order those ahead of time. Uh, microfilm is normally self-serve, but during the pandemic, we don't have any self-service options at the moment. So even things like the newspapers, you do have to um, order ahead for when you come in to, to have your visit. People often ask, what is the main difference between a library and an archive? So these are some of the main differences. Um, as I've, I keep mentioning primary source materials, so the documents that we have in the archives, they're original documents, uh, the first time that the information was created in the way that it was, um, as opposed to a book or a newspaper where information is researched and then interpreted and distilled in, an, in a new way in a secondary source. So that's the biggest difference. We have stricter security measures, even more so now during the pandemic, but even prior to the pandemic, again, because the material is unique and irreplaceable, we do have very strict security measures um, around accessing it. Um, it is also very fragile, some of it. So we have um, rules around handling the material that are a little bit different than in a library where you're allowed to browse and pull things off the shelf. One of the biggest differences, and this is something that I'm going to spend a bit of time on today, is the catalog versus a finding aid. Um, and this is really important. The reason I want to spend some time on it is because to really be successful in your search, it helps to truly understand how we organize our information. So a library catalog is organized by item. So if you think of a book, um, when you go into a library catalog, you can link from that book to the author of the book and see other books that they've authored. You can look at the subject headings that they're connected to and see other books that fall under that subject heading. Those are really helpful and interesting, but they're not essential to understanding that book. If you wanted to read The Hobbit, you can read it and enjoy it and understand it without needing to know anything else that Tolkien has written or anything else that falls under the subject headings that that book falls under. In the archives, we do sometimes describe things at the item level, particularly photographs where you might need specific information about that item. But generally speaking, to really understand an item, it's better to know the entire context in which it was created. 
So we describe the records at a higher level so that you can see how they're connected to other records that were created at the same time in the same process by the same creator. So for example, a letter from Emily Carr to her friend at a certain point in time in the 20s is really interesting. And reading that letter, you'll be able to get some information about who Emily Carr is and her life and what she was doing. But if you understand it in the greater context of all of the records that she created, then you get to know, you'll have a better understanding of what's happening in that particular item. So if you were to research Emily Carr, we would recommend that you go to the top level of description, which tells you all about who Emily Carr is and what she did in her life. And it also will give you an understanding of all of the records that we have in our archives um, that were created by Emily Carr. And then you could look down the tree, we call it a tree, it's sort of like pointy top of the tree is the description of the creator. And then all the records that they create come below that. And you can look at all those records and get an understanding of all the different things that she created and how they're interconnected. And I'm going to show you examples of this on our database so that you get an idea of how it looks when you're doing research on our database. That final um, level, I, do, I don't have a lot of time to get into why I put in theory at the end, but uh, the idea of being objective caretakers of the information is something that you often hear in archives. Again, um, in a different way than in other places, uh, archivists generally don't take on the role of um, interpreting the records. That's really up to you as the researcher. So we provide access to the information and then it's your job to interpret it and, and work, do with it what you will. We have three databases. Our main BC Archive Search database is a database called Access to Memory or Atom. We have a genealogy database and we have a library database. And I'll show you briefly um, how each one of those works. Jenny, when we related, ask people, sorry, related to that uh, question, do we contribute to the world catalog or, or some type of worldwide catalog? That's a good question. So um, one of the, the complications with archival uh, descriptive work is that different places and different countries, you have different descriptive standards that they adhere to. So they don't at the moment match up exactly around the world. So there are um, often conglomerate databases. So for example, there's a database um, for BC repositories, particularly smaller ones contribute it to it so that you can search in one place to look at material that is held in different places in British Columbia. Um, and then what we try and do is link as much as possible to related records in other places. A lot of people do, they, there's a lot of talk about making more comprehensive databases that would include information from around the world, but that hasn't really happened yet. Uh, for those of you who are interested in genealogy, there are international databases that um, collect genealogical records, so vital events records like birth, marriages, and death records. And um, uh, some of those databases that you may have heard of have used records from our genealogy database to contribute to those broader international genealogy databases. So before people come in and do research, even when it's not a pandemic, we ask people to do as much research online on their own as possible before they come on site so that they're really well prepared. Uh, now during the pandemic, it's essential because we are um, having people come on site by appointment. We ask that you prepare all of the records that you want ahead of time and send them to us in a form so that we can prepare them ahead of time um, because people have more limited time on site. So briefly, I'll just, I'll show the genealogy database really briefly in the interest of time. I can't get too much into it today, but we do have, uh, we have some other genealogy resources online. Um, we did a genealogy, an indigenous genealogy uh, workshop a while back, which is online as Kim mentioned. Um, and that uh, has some really great basic information about doing genealogical research uh, at the archives. This database contains vital events records, births, marriages, and deaths, as I mentioned. And it's a great way to, uh, to find out some of that initial information about your family. When you do a search, I always recommend that you start with a little bit of information and then narrow it, add more if you need to narrow down the results afterwards. 
the name that I put in here is the name of my great grandmother. So I always like to use her as an example. And the first name there, I put it in asterisks because that way it will look for that name in the first name spot and the middle name spot. Um, so this will help to broaden the search. People often went by their middle names and maybe even their close family didn't realize that that's what they were doing. And this search brought up one result. Um, Kim, I see lots of questions coming through. Is there something specific to this before I continue on? There are two questions about um, birth, marriage, and death records. Yeah. Uh, Yvonne is wondering, how can we view them? Uh, can, can we view marriage and death registrations that are indexed but not digitized? So any records that we have on microfilm, um, and most of the ones that have been indexed should be on microfilm. There are rare exceptions. Um, if they haven't been digitized, then you can either come on site and view the microfilm and anything that's on microfilm, you can scan for free onto a memory stick. If you bring a memory stick on site with you, if you're not able to come on site, you can order that record. And there's a small fee connected to ordering it from a distance. And I have information about reproductions later in the presentation. But if you can find a description like this of the record, then it's really easy to order that record and have a copy sent to you. So uh, hopefully question, that helps. Yep. Thank you. A question from Barry. When will the rest of the marriage and death records become available online? For example, actual photos of the certificates. Many are missing in the early to mid 1900s. Yeah, that's a good point. So the records in this database are technically owned by the Vital Statistics Agency. So we um, work in partnership with the Vital Statistics Agency to make them accessible and available. Um, some of them, I'm, I can't, I'm not sure exactly what's happening, but their digitization pro uh, program, I think is just a little behind and they have some uh, records that have not yet been digitized. As far as I understand, they are working towards getting them digitized and we'll make sure to let people know as soon as we know if there's new batches coming through. We always um, put out information on our, on our um, social media and put up announcements if we can. Um, but I'm afraid it's not done through our departments. So um, I don't know where they're at with those projects. We are in touch. I know people from the archives are in touch with them regularly to, to keep updated on that. We do get our annual updates of new records that are released, but I don't know how often that includes older records that they've uh, re-digitized. Uh, we have a comment here from Saskatchewan saying, um, why do some provinces like Saskatchewan not allow searching online for birth, marriage and death records? Every province has different legislation around these types of records. So it's one of the quirky things about having a decentralized government system like we do in Canada, that some of these services that are done provincially, they're managed very differently in every province. Um, and I don't know what the rules are in Saskatchewan. There might be different privacy rules. So this type of information, um, because they're kept private for a certain number of years, they may have different rules around when the information can be released. Um, but on top of that, it also, it's a lot of work to digitize the records and then make them accessible online. Um, maintaining a database is, is costly and, and can be um, a lot of work to keep up. So I'm not sure what the situation is in Saskatchewan, but uh, there's lots of, of things, factors that play into it. Um, however, if you are from Saskatchewan and you're looking for records, if they're not available um, online or if, if you can't get them through the archives, there is, you are often able to apply to the vital, um, the vital events or the vital statistics department directly to access records that are relating to you or your family. So I would recommend going to them if you can't get them through the archives. And one more yeah. question, and maybe you mentioned this, but what are the years of restrictions on the marriage, death and birth records? I'm just gonna go back because I often get it wrong in my head. <laughs> marriages, I always remember, marriages are 75 years. So we don't get marriage registrations until 75 years after the event. Uh, birth records, I believe are 120 years. You can see that right now we have them up until 1903. And so approximately. Um, and then death records, we get about 40 years after the event. No, that's not right. I think we're supposed to get them 20 years after the event, but we, I don't think we're quite caught up with those yet. 
So the reasons for the restrictions on them are um, to make those records available to the people to whom they pertain. They're considered active records. So you keep a marriage record open and active in the vital events department for 75 years, because in theory, you could be married for 75 years and alive for that time. And then if you needed to get a copy of your own registration, you would apply to the vital events, um, the vital stats department and get a copy of it. After that, it becomes public. So it's all about protecting the privacy of the people that are recorded in those records. Um, and we, we try and update that annually when we get new batches of records in. So after you see a description of a record like this, if you uh, are lucky enough, you'll see that last uh, tab there, which says vital stat images, and it has a, a link to a JPEG where you can see the certificate of registration of marriage or whatever it is that you found in your search. And any of these that are on our database, you can download these and, and save them for your own personal use. So um, if they are online, then you don't need to come on site at all. If they're not online, you can order a copy from us using the microfilm number. I'm gonna go back for a minute there. Um, but you could send in that registration number that's right there under the event type marriage registration number and microfilm number. And if you send that information in to us, uh, that's really helpful to help um, us to find it for you. There's a comment that often when looking at the, the digitized versions online, they seem darker. So this person has ordered them and found that when they order them, they're much brighter and easier to read and they're a little darker online. Is there a purpose? Is there a reason for that? That might be because of when they were scanned. So we now have really good high-tech scanners that you can adjust the image when you're scanning it. Whereas before with the old manual scanners, um, all of the digitized images were made generally speaking, were made from the microfilm. So you had to load the microfilm and then make the digital image from that. And if the machine didn't have the ability to adjust the light very well, then um, it may have come out quite dark. Now with our new scanners, it's amazing what the technology is. You can really adjust it on these digital scanners that we have and, and get it looking really sharp. This is our library database. I'm not going to spend a long time on this, but if you look on the left, when you go to our website, you can. this is what you'll see on the left. And this is where you can find our, our databases is under uh, the tab that says search and you'll see it says search genealogy, search BC archives and search library. Our library database is similar to other library databases that you've probably used. So I won't spend too much time on it, but feel free to have a look through it and see what's in our collections. And this is our main database. The main database, um, the main database covers the majority of the records in our collections. Uh, it is so all of those records that we talked about, the the um, cartographic records, textual records, photographs. This is where you'll find descriptions of them. I highly recommend you watch the little video that we have there on the main page. It's just a few minutes long but it'll give you some tips and tricks for making your search really successful. Under the gray tabs, you can see uh, some more documentation that help you. Um, that PDF, how do I search descriptions, gives you lots of information and will cover a lot of what I'm touching on today. So again, if you're new to this type of research, please do spend some time looking through the documentation that we have online. If you've never done research before, but you have a general subject area that you're interested in, maybe you're interested in mining in BC, or you're interested in, in horses, or who knows what you're interested in, um, you can always start by doing a subject search. I'm going to go back one tab, and over here on the left where it says browse by, you'll see different options, and one of them is subjects. If you click on that, you can search subject headings. This will not be completely comprehensive. Uh, the subject headings have to be added by an archivist when they're writing the description. Um, so that it's really variable how many things are tagged with the subject heading, but it can be a good place to start. And it might help you think outside the box about what types of records could exist. So it might not occur to you that, oh, these records could be in this government file that I hadn't really considered before. So it's a good way to, to get a start. Again, I'm gonna go back for a second. Up here, you can see the search bar. This is a general search bar, but then you can also click on advanced search. 
And there's lots of different options here. I'm just checking the time. I'm going to, I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful. Uh, under the advanced search, you can uh, search in lots of different ways. Again, the video and the documentation will talk about using Boolean operators to narrow down your search. So I'm not going to get too much into that right now or using asterisks and other different ways to really make your search really, really um, specific to what you're looking for. Um, and I, if you're having trouble with your search, I recommend looking through those doc that documentation. If you want to only search photographs, for example, then you can put in a search term here and then go down to general material designation. Can you see my, my cursor there? Yeah. And next to general material designation, there's a drop down box. And for photographs, you would choose graphic material. And that will narrow down your search to photographs as well as drawings and paintings. Um, if you were only interested in maps, then you would choose cartographic material. So again, you have to think of those words that we use that are a little bit different. You can narrow it down by a date range and it doesn't have to include a month and day. You can put 1900 to 1910 and that will help you narrow down your search as well. After you run a search, you'll get a list of results. This particular list, um, I did a snapshot of this because it shows how it doesn't sort them by record type. So you'll get a lot of different results together that will be of different types of records. So this first one, this is for a search for Rogers Pass. You can see this is what we call the call number. Every call number is very different and they can be very confusing when you first start doing research here. Those call numbers represent all the different legacy ways that we described records in the past, and that's why they all look a little bit different. But as you start to get used to them, you'll realize, you'll start to recognize what they are. This one, there's usually hints down in this little bit of description, or sometimes you can find out what it is up here. This is a film. So this is describing a film. This one, the call number starts with the letters GR. GR stands for government records. So this one, um, it says that it's a file and we'll look at that one in a minute so you can see what it would look, the description would look like. Down here, we've got an item that has this particular style of number and that is what photograph call numbers look like. And you can see a thumbnail here. If you were to open that, you'd be able to open that picture up nice and big and get a really good look at that photo. And down here where it says PDP, that's for the painting, drawing, and print collection. So when you see all of these listed here, like I said, it can be a little confusing at first to figure out what exactly am I looking at, but everyone you can open it up and get more information. When you click on that government record file, it gives you a bit of information about what it is. We know now that it's a textual record. It's a file, so you can think of an actual file folder filled with papers. We know it's from the early 60s. And this is what I really want to make sure people notice because this can be really helpful. When I talked before about the tree with the, the top of the tree being the creator and then all the things that they created below it, up here is the top of the tree. And then these are all those lower levels. So this is where we are here. This is a file that's part of a sub-series of site files. But if you went up here, I can't do it here because this is a screenshot, but if you clicked on this top level, you'd be able to learn all about the office that created this file. It would give you information about when they created it and why, what the purpose was of these files. And when you read that, that'll help you to know, is this file titled Rogers Pass something I'm interested in? Will it contain the information and the types of documents that I need? And then you'll know whether it's something you'd like to order to either have scanned and sent to you or for you to come in and look at on site. Any more questions so far that I should stop for, Kim? There, there are there are some questions. I'm going to save <laughs> some for the end because of, because of your timing. Yeah. But this one is uh, the question is which database would you find the film records if you were if you were searching for a specific? So that would be in the main database, the one that's called BC Archive Search, that Adam database, Access to Memory. Um, so most of the records are in that database, which is everything I'm showing you now comes from that particular database called BC Archive Search. So the genealogy database only has births, marriages, and deaths, and the library database only has publications. 
Um, again, some of these photos, I, I took these from a presentation I did to educators. So there's a lot of school related photos coming up, but um, the next few slides, I wanted to show you some examples of different types of records, just to give you an idea of what you could find. Um, and again, this is trying to remind people that government records are not only policy records or government documents. Um, there's also some amazing photographs. So as you can see, I just have to shift my screen a bit so I can read what I said. This is part of the Provincial Education Media Center Photograph Collection. There's some beautiful photographs in this collection. Um, so government records can be full of wonderful information about communities and people. This is another example of a government re record relating to schools. The uh, Teachers Bureau forms, they were um, reports that teachers would send uh, in the 20s about rural schools. So usually one room schoolhouses, they give a great, uh, they capture what the school was like, but also what the community was like, because they ask about the chief industry of the district. This is one of my favorites. I grew up in Langford and my grandfather would always talk about how when he was growing up, it was a resort town because people would come from Victoria to stay on all the lakes in Langford. So Florence Lake, Langford Lake and Glen Lake and how the population would expand so greatly in the summer. And here it talks about the chief industry of the district as poultry raising, residential and resort. And it's almost a suburb of Victoria, but not quite. Here's another example uh, from Alice Arm. Some of these documents had photos attached as well, which is really interesting. And this one talks a lot about the activities that people would participate in in this small mining town. Um, and you can get a real sense of what it was like to live in these places in the 20s. So that's a really fun collection. Um, so any of these ones, if you go back and, and put in the, the numbers that I'm showing you, you'll get um, you'll get a list of all of the records relating to that collection. Private records are uh, often from people. And this is an example of one of the few collections of records that we have that was created by a child. Dirk Fraser went to a prep school, a boarding school, and he would write home to his mother and his sister and write them wonderful letters. Um, so I like sharing this one with people. In this letter, he talks about a really exciting event that happened when he fell in the gym and got a splinter in his stomach and he had to go to the hospital, but don't worry, he didn't die. He made sure to be clear about that in his letter. Um, but my favorite part is that he included the splinter in the letter. He stuck it right through the paper and measured it so that everybody would know exactly how big it was. Uh, very important, of course, when you're 12 years old or whatever he was in that in the letter. Um, he also made elaborate board games and, uh, and things for his sister. So we have all of those in the collection as well. It's a really beautiful collection of records. And I'm going to skip through the next few quickly just to give you an idea of some of the things we have. This is a description of an oral history collection and shows you some descriptions of the types of oral histories. Again, everything from politicians to, um, to forestry workers. This is a collection of uh, the map that I showed you in that one of those first slides. I wanted to show you a few more of their beautiful hand colored maps that were made um, during the Joint Reserve Commission's work where they were carving up the land into uh, reserves for Indigenous people to live on. So really important, but, um, but difficult records to look at, but also have these amazing maps that Indigenous communities access regularly to look at what the land looked like before the reserves were later um, uh, shrunk into even smaller amounts of land. Lots of detail in these maps. So here's a snap from our a snapshot from our website um, where you can get more information. I haven't listed all of the guides and inventories. We have a lot. So if you go to the website and there's a particular subject area that you're interested in, maybe it's court records, maybe you're looking for a divorce record, um, or it could be further information about genealogy. We have a lot of subject guides and inventories that will help you with your research. Those are, um, most of them are online now. So please do have a good look through those. While I've got this up on the screen, 
also under, so when you go to the BC Archives website, you'll see all these headings. And under tools, you'll also see instructional films. I didn't have time today, but I highly recommend looking through those films, including the one called What's Your Story? And that's a great film about a researcher, uh, Dr. Evan Adams, who is the head of the First Nations Health Authority. He came in and did family research with us and he made a little documentary film uh, to show how the kinds of things that you can find and how great and meaningful it can be to do this sort of research at the archives. It's a really wonderful film, I recommend it. If you want to order records, we have forms online to do that. So again, if you can't come on site, um, most things can be ordered. So there are times where we can't copy things either because they're too fragile, so they have a, a conservation restriction on them. That sometimes happens with photographs that are on glass plate negatives that are maybe they're cracked or they're very fragile. Um, sometimes with older documents that can't handle the exposure to the light. Uh, but for most things, you can order copies of records and we can send it to you digitally. There's information about um, how to do that as well as prices all on our website. Anything that you can't find or you need help with, always feel free to email us. I'll put our email up on the last slide for everyone to see, but it is access at royalbcmuseum.bc.ca. Again, that'll be up in a minute. So normally, if we were all on site together, I would take you into the reference room and tell you how, what it would be like to be sitting in the room. I'd show you some care and handling procedures, but we can't do that now. Uh, so particularly during the pandemic, I've just got a couple more slides here about being on site, but during the pandemic, it's extra important to get all of your, uh, your list of records that you're interested in ready ahead of time because we're not able to take orders on site at the moment. So you have to send us a list ahead of time and book an appointment to come on site. So anything that you're interested in seeing. We also have information on our website about what you can bring into the reference room. We do require you to wear a mask right now. The main things are no pens, no food, no drinks. You can bring notepads and pencils to make notes. Um, and you can bring your laptop computer. You have to sign it in with the security um, desk, but you can bring those sorts of things in. And we do encourage you to bring in a camera or phone to take photos of documentation so that you can take home images of some of the records without having, that you don't need an exact reproduction of. And there's no cost for doing that. And of course, bring a memory stick. If you're looking at anything on microfilm, you can scan it for free. There's information about visiting on our website as well, and you can book your appointment online using an online form. So when it before the pandemic, you didn't have to make an appointment ahead of time, but now you, you do because we're limiting how many people can be in the room at a time. Normally when you would come on site, you'd be able to fill in this call slip and that would allow you to order more records while you're on site. I wanted to show it to you because I'm hoping that one day we'll go back to those rules. Um, but right now we're not using those call slips. You do have to plan your records ahead of time. And that's it. I've talked for a long time. I'm happy to take lots of questions. I'll leave the slide up so that you can take down that email address in particular. Any questions that you have, or if you get stuck as you do your research, please email us. Um, and an archivist will get back to you with some information. Thank you, Genevieve. There was a question from earlier that relates to those loans. Do you do like an inter-archival loan? If someone wanted to see microfilm or microfiche, could, you, could they send it to another archives for them to look at? No, unfortunately we don't do that. I think that used to happen a long time ago, but we don't do that anymore. Um, we're trying to, as things are more uh, readily accessible digitally, we are trying to share more information that way and work together with other archives to make copies and share them out that way. Um, but we're not able to, to, um, to send microphone to other places or to receive it from other places right now. Thank you. There's a clarification about, uh, we, I was asking a question about uh, birth, death and marriage records and I said in Saskatchewan they weren't available. There's a correction. 
Um, birth and death records are online, but marriages aren't indexed yet in Saskatchewan. Oh. So, uh, but okay. as Genevieve was saying, that, that'll be different in each province. Um, another question about records, baptism records, are they under some of the same um, restrictions as the other records you mentioned? That's, that's a really interesting one. So baptismal records are not government records. Those are records that are owned by the, the church. And you may have noticed that on our genealogy database, we list that we do have some baptism records. The baptismal records that we have are copies of the information that were in the registers. So we don't have scans of the registers, but we have some of the, the details from the registers. And that was part of a project where certain churches lent us their baptismal um, registers and volunteers entered the information into our database. Uh, but that was on a strictly voluntary basis. Um, so when you're doing your research, please bear in mind that those definitely will not be comprehensive. It was only some churches that lent us their registers. Uh, there, it's really great when you do find baptismal information because they contain a lot of information. Um, but if you don't find baptismal information for your relative um, or your community, my recommendation would be to go to the church that um, it's connected to or to the diocese. So depending on if it's a United Church record, um, they have a centralized archives in Vancouver, same with the Anglican Church. Uh, the Catholic Church generally keeps their records by diocese. So there's, um, I think, three dioc diocese uh, records, central centralized places in British Columbia, one for Vancouver Island, one for uh, Vancouver in the Lower Mainland, and one for Northern BC that's, I think, connected to the Yukon. So you would go to the diocesan uh, archives for those. Thank you. And sometimes they're still with the actual church. And we'll get you to stop sharing your screen and oh, so folks can see you while you answer uh, a couple more questions for us. Um, this is also about record types. Do, um, does the archives have land transactions and tax rolls? We definitely do, yes. We have lots of information, lots of different land records um, and, and some tax roll records. Um, in uh, the genealogy, um, uh, in the genealogy workshops that I've done, I talk about those to some degree. Um, and I think those would be on the one that's online that I've done. But you can certainly uh, do a search on the database to see what you can find. There are uh, research guides specifically about those types of land records. So there's one specific to preemption records, uh, land records generally. It's quite a in-depth and big research guide, I'll warn you. Um, and then any questions you have, please do email, email the archives. I a noticed a about, question coming up about prison, criminal and prison records. Yes. We yeah, go ahead. Um, we do. So I didn't get into restrictions today. Uh, so some criminal and prison records, we do get those. Uh, some of them will have restrictions on them uh, under the Protection of Privacy Act. Uh, restrictions don't mean that you can't access the records, so it means that there's a different process to requesting uh, access to the records. So we have information on our website about restrictions and privacy requests. So if you're doing a search on our database and you find prison records or if you suspect that what you're looking for might be um, a restricted record, you can contact us to check about that. And related, I imagine, is a question about psychiatric records. Yes, so we have uh, the records of the um, BC Mental Health Hospital, uh, which was known as um, Riverview or Essendale before that. Um, and those records uh, do have restrictions. So generally speaking, records tend to be restricted for 100 years. There's some exceptions and differences depending on the type of record. But a lot of those records, um, are restricted for a fairly long amount of time to protect the rights of the people that are recorded in them. But again, you can request access to those records. Family members often do request access to their relatives' records, um, and those will you'll be able to um, to get access to those records uh, usually, with some exceptions. Thank you. Now, looking at the time, I'm going to um, offer two more questions. And then we will stop the recording. If you're able to stay a little longer, Genevieve, um, do you have time to, we can go over a few more questions, but we'll just do that for the folks here on Zoom. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's a question here. Does 
BC Archives as a public institution have any mechanism or mandate to nationalize data assembled by corporate private entities? Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, can you read that again, just to make yeah. sure I'm answering it Do correctly? Do we have a mechanism or mandate to nationalize data assembled by corporate private entities? No, the short answer is no. Um, so there is legislation and rules around, um, around managing and keeping information created by government bodies. Uh, and But there is no rules, that's not true. There are rules around private, private records but companies do not have to give their records to a public institution. They can choose to if they want to, but they are not required to. What they are required to do is there are rules around what information they can and can't keep for how long. So, um, you know, there's rules around, around the types of records that they have to manage for a certain amount of time. A lot of private organizations, uh, don't worry too much about records management or archives until they get into trouble when they're trying to find information that they should have kept, or maybe they've kept information that they shouldn't have about a private person. Um, but uh, but there aren't there's no there's no rule that says that they have to give their information to a public body. All right, thank you. And this is a question I've wondered about myself as well. Uh, this is from Brenda. If we identify things that are incorrectly labeled or the photo is reversed um, or someone's you know, misnamed, is there someone we should contact? Do you want that feedback? Uh, yes. Um, so yeah, if you notice something, it's a little different with vital events records. If you notice a mistake in the vital events records, uh, it actually ends up going to the vital statistics agency. So you can contact them directly. Uh, you can contact us and we often save a bunch up and then send them to them at once. They're not always able to change it. Um, vital events records are an interesting one because the, the mistake, there's often mistakes in them and it's because of just natural human error. If when somebody dies, for example, uh, the person filling out the form would have, um, they would contact uh, the next of kin to get the information, but if they couldn't reach them, they would find somebody else, maybe somebody else who lived in their apartment building to help them fill out that document. Um, and that person might not have the right information. Those mistakes, once they're recorded, can't be changed. Um, they could make a note on the file, but they wouldn't be changed on the actual form. At any rate, if you do see a mistake in a vital events record, you can contact Vital Statistics Agency directly. Um, to ask about having it changed. Um, other records, the ones that are in our main database, please do feel free to email us. It'll be assigned to one of our archivists and we'll be able to review it. And it's helpful to have uh, information. Sometimes, again, if the information was, if something was incorrectly labeled, we may choose to leave the original label and then add information to it to correct it and update it. Um, and that's because we, we like to maintain the creator's original um, labels, even if it's a mistake. There is that sometimes there is helpful information, even in mistakes, but it's always helpful to get updates. Right, and that would just be the access email, Genevieve? Yes, yep, that yeah. access email is a great email for everything. If it needs to go somewhere else, we'll, we'll pass it on to the, to the right place if it comes in there. Terrific. Well, we will take a few more questions, but we're gonna end the recording. If you are watching us on Facebook and you'd like to, hear the answers to a few more questions or you'd like to ask them, please join us on that Zoom link and uh, we'll be able to, you'll be able to join us there. But in the meantime, again, I want to thank you, Genevieve, um, for this um, robust presentation about the archives and the, and the resources are there. It's certainly answered a lot of questions um, that I have about using archives and I'm sure uh, will generate a lot of use and interest. If you, again, if you joined us late or you missed something and you want to go back, this has been recorded and you will find it on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. So please have a look there. The Royal BC Museum has reopened and we are ready to welcome you back. And you can find out more on our website about timed tickets and exhibits. We will be continuing at home, at home kids and at outside for the foreseeable future. And links for all of those programs are posted on the Royal BC Museum's website. Next week, January 26th, 
I'll be talking with Leah Silver from IMAX Victoria. She'll get a behind the scenes look at IMAX and learn more about the theater and its plans for the new year. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and one another. Thank you. Bye-bye.